Hello everyone, my name is Dr. August de Oliveira, and I wanted to record uh, this little movie um, just because there's a lot of questions these days about 3D printing and orthodontics, uh, most importantly how to make your own aligners uh, in the dental office. Um, definitely two camps out there. Um, there seems to be a camp out there that says, hey, this is a big waste of time. You can just send everything to Invisalign. They'll do all the work for you and uh, you don't have to worry about anything. And there's definitely a lot of merit to that. However, hopefully in this video, I can show you some other options that you have where you can make your own aligners in your office, have a little more control over the case, um, but most importantly, save yourself and your patient quite a bit of money. Um, Invisalign's been around for a while. I've been doing Invisalign for close to about 20 years now and I love it. I've had great success with it. Um, I think that everyone will agree though that the lab fees associated with Invisalign are really high and as a result um, we have to charge enough uh, for our time and the lab bill and our patients are ending up paying quite a bit of money for an Invisalign case. Um, now with other companies out there like Exceed Ortho, IROC DDS, uh, or arch form, we don't have to spend as much uh, with a lab bill and we can reduce that lab cost uh, including 3D printing the models to about 300 bucks a case and we can certainly pass that on to our patients and increase uh, the acceptance rate of this treatment and give more patients the smiles that they want. If you guys don't know me, uh, my name is Dr. August de Oliveira. I'm a general dentist in LA. Um, written a couple of books out there. Um, Implants Made Easy and Guided Implantology Made Easy are books on how to place implants. My latest book, uh, it's not listed on the slide, is uh, Dental 3D Printing Made Easy and it's all about 3D printing in the dental office. I've been lecturing for a while. I started out uh, with Serona back in 2004 teaching CIRAC and I currently teach now for a number of companies uh, including Implant Direct, Serona, um, Moonray, Patterson and Henry Schein. Um, if you want to check out a cool website, please check out digitallyenamel.com. I am one of the co-founders along with my buddy Todd Ehrlich. Uh, we offer that site for the low, low price of free. You don't need a login. You don't need a password. Um, just a lot of cases out there. Todd handles all the pretty stuff like veneers and crowns and things like that. I tend to cover more bloody stuff. Um, so bone grafting, dental implants, 3D printing, and although 3D printing is certainly not bloody, um, I tend to be a bit clumsy sometimes, so I guess it can be. Uh, let's first, before we get started, um, talk a little bit about 3D printing in orthodontics and the requirements that we need. So the American Board of Orthodontics set up some guidelines actually for how we should be 3D printing our models. And look, if you don't know uh, a lot about 3D printing, there's tons of resources out there. Um, go on Digital Enamel. Um, I teach a course called a 3D printing party. Um, you can go on Eventbrite and type that in and come to one of my courses. We have one coming up in Jacksonville next week and in Boston next week uh, and one in LA later on. So check that out. But there is some confusion when it comes to 3D printing and the resolution of your scan and the accuracy of your scan. And one um, area uh, that really kind of bugs me is 3D printing definition of resolution is different than our digital dentistry resolution. So lots and lots of printer companies will come out and tell you, oh, we've got a resolution of, uh, on our scanner doctor of 20 microns. And 20 microns, if we think about accuracy, if we're thinking about the smallest point that a printer can possibly make, you would think 20 microns, that's pretty awesome. But the term resolution in 3D printing simply means 
how thick the layers are. And most printers can print at a 20 micron per layer resolution. That has nothing to do with the, uh, the actual you know, screens or projectors or lasers. It actually has to do with a little bolt that turns, which is called your Z axis. So the American Board of Orthodontics has set up that the scan layer height, AKA resolution, should be at 100 microns or, or better. And with printers like the Form 2 and printers like the Moonray, most of what we print are at 100 micron layers. Um, the next order of business is they set the scan accuracy at 200 microns or better. What is scan accuracy? Well, the scan accuracy is how much a model will deviate from the STL that you're given. So if I have a highly detailed STL that has little grooves that are 20 microns, um, but my printer only has an accuracy of 200 microns, those details won't show up. And the way that you check scan accuracy is to print out some sort of a calibration object, usually a calibration cube, which could be 10 millimeters in diameter. You actually print it out, you measure it, and you see how much it deviates. So if you print out a calibration cube and it's 10.1 millimeters, you're actually pretty good. We want to stay within 200 microns. Um, you always want to calibrate your resins. If you are using open source resins, this can be a bit of a problem, um, but refer to your individual printers for steps for calibration. Okay, so let's talk a little bit aligners. So 98% of the ortho I do with 3D printing is aligner based. And so what's an aligner? Well, we know what an aligner is. An aligner is uh, a vacuum form or pressure formed piece of plastic that goes over your teeth. Um, a software develops teeth at multiple stages of movement and through these aligners, the patient will move their teeth. Well, there's two sort of ways in which teeth are moved with aligners. A displacement driven method is simply to make a model, move a tooth in the model, do a vacuum form or pressure form of that model and stick it on the, on the patient's mouth. That tooth will want to shove into the place where that crown has been moved. And we call this displacement driven forces. Um, the other method is a force driven way of moving teeth in which we can move teeth by grabbing onto an attachment or pushing onto an attachment in a certain way or a power ridge which will exert for force at different points in the teeth. In MTM type places, we may even have a caliper or some sort of a divot which will push teeth around. So basically we have two forces. We have uh, a deformation of the aligner which puts force on different points of the teeth, which is usually good for rotational type movements or translational type movements where we bodily move teeth. But for tipping, we simply move part of the tooth or we move the crown of the tooth to a different spot. And uh, by the way, these are uh, taken from John Morton's lecture, The Biomechanics of Invisalign. Well, we've got lots of attachments. If you are familiar with Invisalign or ClearCorrect, you may uh, put these little bumps on the teeth with composite, and each attachment does something different. Knowing what attachments do can help you if you are simply evaluating a ClinCheck and you want a specific type of movement for a tooth, or if you're designing your own case, and we'll talk about an arch form, uh, which is a software which will allow you to do that. So if we have extrusive type movements, 
um, we can use a horizontal rectangular attachment. Um, this may be beveled or this may not be beveled depending on the system that you're using. And those are great for pulling down teeth. Um, you want them to be fairly robust, especially on laterals, because usually laterals are our nemesis and they're the ones that we want to extrude at times. Vertical rectangular type attachments are kind of old school, uh, but they're best for translating teeth. So moving a tooth into a space. So let's say you have a post extraction case and you want to move some teeth into the extraction site. A rectangular attachment can do that. Rectangular attachments can also facilitate rotation, although there are better attachments for it. Ellipsoid attachments are certainly good uh, for rotational type movements. I like to place ellipsoid attachments on molars um, just to anchor my aligner um, so that it pops on nice. But typically an ellipsoid attachment will be placed on a tooth far away from the axis of rotation and directed in a specific way we, where we want to rotate the crown of the tooth. And finally, paired ellipsoid attachments are best for root torques. So if we want to tip a tooth mesial or distally or rotate the tooth 300, not 360 degrees, but along uh, the sort of x-axis, if you will, um, of the tooth, we use paired ellipsoid attachments. So what do I do in my office? Well, I've been a big Invisalign user for a long time, and I got to tell you, I still love it. And if I have a tough case or a case that lasts more than 18 months, um, still send it to Invisalign. Inv Invisalign is just so easy to use. They've invented the system. Um, the drawback is that the lab bill is $1,800 for Invisalign, and as a result, my fee for Invisalign is normal for my area, but certainly is somewhat high. For cases between six to 18 months, I use a company called Exceed. What Exceed does is it plans the case for me, um, sets it all up, um, divides the case into individual 3D printed models. I print those models out and do a pressure form uh, with a uh, machine called a Drufamat and that pressure formed aligner is then trimmed and polished and delivered to the patient. Um, usually the fees are about $240. It's gonna cost you about 60 bucks in resin and in pressure form sheets. Um, I'm not including the labor of my staff. Um, my staff's gotta work anyway. So uh, depending on how busy your office is, we've got certainly some downtime in my schedule. We're not going gangbusters all the time. Um, I tend to lecture and travel a lot. So my office is open while I'm not there. So my staff can certainly work on that and I have to pay them anyway. Um, been playing around lately with a really cool software called Archform. Archform is a free software. Um, so you design your case, um, Archform will divide the models up for you for a fee of $50 per case, and you plan them out. Um, I'm going to say this right now, um, Archform is really designed for use by orthodontists. Um, however, if you have some experience with ortho and certainly aligner therapy, I certainly can see it being useful for general dentists for really minor teeth movement cases. We're talking class one uh, molar, possibly class one canine or not too much division of a class one canine, just some lower anterior crowding, maybe some upper anterior crowding, definitely under six months or under 12 aligners. Um, so for about a hundred bucks, um, we can provide this for our patients. And as a result, my lab bill keeps going down and we've drastically cut our price, uh, what we charge for a full Invisalign case, um, pretty much uh, half. And so we can provide a lot of these treatments for patients uh, for a very nominal fee. 
So let's go over an actual clinical case. So um, here's a case where uh, we've got some crowding. Uh, we've got some overlap between a lateral and a central. Um, and uh, class one uh, canine, class one molar. Um, so not a lot of work involved. So we use a company called Exceed. Uh, Exceed charges $190 per case. Now you might notice it says 240 up on the top. They do charge you um, if you want to use PayPal. Um, if you want to actually go in and do a wire transfer, um, you can do it for about 190 bucks. Uh, Got to be honest with you, that's I'm just not going to do that. <laughs> so um, I use PayPal and I pay the big bucks. But it's certainly a lot cheaper than the $1,800 I was paying with Invisalign. Um, one common question I get is if you're using an intraoral scanner, um, do I have to put a base on the models that I'm doing? And absolutely no, you do not. And uh, in fact, Exceed does not want you to add a base to the model. They're gonna take care of all that for you. Um, just like Invisalign, you get a ClinCheck or whatever the ClinCheck name is in Exceed Ortho. Um, it, tells you where the attachments are going to go. It tells you how much IPR is required in between the teeth and at what stages the IPR needs to uh, be done. Um, you get a bunch of models to print. I'm gonna tell you right now, um, some detractors from in-office aligners say, oh my God, you gotta print you know, 40 models, you know, you're gonna be working for hours and hours. We only print about uh, a month's worth of aligners at a time. And the reason why is if you have to do a refinement, then you're going to have to basically waste all the models you printed if you printed the entire case. Um, so we print it month by month. My staff does this. I don't do any of this. Um, they make the aligners, they print the aligners, they load up the software. Um, and so it's really not a lot of work on my case. Um, you can see here the detail we get. Uh, this model was printed on the Form 2 printer. Uh, we want to use a pressure former uh, because we want to really capture the details. Uh, pressure former exerts pressure from below like a vacuum former, but also on top. And if you vacuum form these, you really kind of get a rounded off attachment. And remember, with attachments, we're directing force against a flat plane. So we really need to capture those details. You do your IPR just as you would normally do your normal IPR. And again, I use the Drufa mat for, uh, for, for making these. Uh, what's the difference between a pressure former and a vacuum former? Well, it's really the amount of pounds per square inch that you get. So the Drufa mat exerts 87 pounds per, uh, per square inch. A garden variety vacuum former is about 15 pounds per square inch. And you can see on the attachments on these patients, the attachments are really crisp and square. And we get that from using a pressure former. Um, as far as materials uh, to be used, um, I do use the Essex Ace uh, one pet peeve I have. Uh, with the Essex Ace material is it only uh, the smallest it comes in or the thinnest it comes in is 0.75 millimeters. So I use that uh, for my actual aligners. Uh, when the patient is finished and I want to retain the case, um, I use one millimeter sheets. However, for the attachments themselves, I use a 0.5 millimeter sheet which I purchased from Great Lakes Ortho. I gotta be honest with you, I don't remember the actual name of the material. Just ask them for the 0.5 millimeter pressure form sheet. What about printing your own aligners? Well, this is certainly a hot topic right now. And the only company I know um, who actually has uh, stated, at least in marketing, um, that they can direct print an aligner is Envision Tech um, with their, they have a specific material which is escaping my mind. However, from what I understand, and don't quote me on this, that it is only designed for what they call aligner zero. 
And a liner zero is simply a mini retainer uh, that does not move teeth and it holds the patient in between getting their brackets off and getting their actual retainer or starting another Invisalign case to tweak teeth after bracket use. So I don't know of an actual direct printing aligner company, uh, but please uh, find me on Digital Enamel or find me on Facebook if you know of it. But I know this is uh, where a lot of people are heading. Okay, so just when I look at a ClinCheck or if I want to design my case, I got a little checklist. And um, these are really based on um, Dr. Andrew's Six Keys to Normal Occlusion. So uh, Dr. Andrew brought us the straight wire technique in orthodontics. So first thing I do is I look for the angle classification of the case. So class one, class two, class three. Um, second thing I look at is the mesial and distal angulation. Um, as we approach the midline, um, the teeth tip less to the distal. So a canine is going to be fairly tipped with the crown tipped the mesial and the root tip distally. But as we approach the centrals on both the maxilla and the mandible, they tend to be fairly straight up and down. The buccolingual angulation of teeth, teeth is very different in different arches. Um, in the maxillary anterior, the crown tip of centrals and laterals are very slightly, about six degrees to the buckle. However, the canines are slightly tipped towards the patient's belly button. And so when I'm looking at a case, I'm looking at that canine relative to those anterior teeth, and I'm also looking at how much buccolingual tip I have with those. Uh, I look for rotations. So looking at the arch, the teeth should not be rotated. Um, class one crowded cases, which is most of what I tend to, to, to do, uh, tend to have some rotations specifically in the anterior, in premolars and canines. Um, we should have no spacing and conversely, we should have no crowding. So the teeth should touch each other with enough force to not pack food. And finally, uh, the curve of speed should be present. Um, as we know from the curve of speed, we have a relatively flat occlusal plane with molars on the lower tipping increasingly mesially as we get uh, to the second and third molars. Uh, on the upper, um, our second and third molars are actually slightly tipped to the distal to compensate for this curve. So just a side note, uh, if you want to go through the basics, a class one occlusion um, is basically such that the upper first molar's mesiobuccal cusp lines up with the central pit or central groove of the lower molar. Um, the lower canine should actually line up with the embrasure between the lateral and the canine of the opposing arch. Um, this is can be both a skeletal and a dental class one, and this is all that I treat. I do not treat class twos and I do not uh, treat class threes. Um, when we get into class twos and class threes, we may have a skeletal component or not. But either way, these, in my opinion, in my office, are just not worth my time. And so those are cases where I certainly ship out to an orthodontist. So let's look at an actual case. So here's a patient. Her chief complaint is that her two front teeth stick out a little too much and she's crowded on her lower front teeth. So let's take a look at the angle classification of this case. So looking at tooth number three, it's hard to see in this, but it is lined up 
with that buckle groove of the lower molar. And certainly tooth number 27 lies just in between tooth number six and seven. So this looks like a case that I could treat in my office. Let's also kind of look at, uh, oh, so here's the uh, canine classification uh, shown a little bit better. So certainly we don't have to worry about moving the canines very much in this case. Things tend to be pretty lined up. Let's take a look at sort of the mesiodistal angulation of teeth. And it uh, looks like on the upper, we're doing pretty good. Um, you know, it, uh, we could tweak things just a little bit, but mesiodistally, things are looking pretty good on the upper. So we know we're not going to have a lot of attachments um, on the upper. Uh, however, on the lower, we're all over the click, all over the case. So we've got teeth going out to the buckle, uh, crowding, and teeth are tipped all over. So we're definitely going to be using some attachments on the lower on this case. Let's look at some rotations. So we've got a little bit of rotation uh, that we have to worry about. So we certainly have our canines are nicely tipped to the lingual. So I know I'm probably just not even going to mess with the upper and lower canines, at least not that much. Um, it looks like tooth number 10 is rotated a little bit uh, counterclockwise. So we're gonna have to rotate that one as well. Uh, We've got mostly a tipping problem on the lower anterior, although there will be some rotations we're gonna deal with. Okay, uh, the submental vertex view um, is a, pretty much the best way to evaluate overlap and overjet. Uh, we can also take a look at midline issues. Um, although at this angle, it looks like the midlines are off, um, but if we look at the digital image, our midlines are actually pretty much there. Maybe just a little bit of tweaking once we um, space and rotate things, but I'm not too worried about a midline movement, but I certainly am a little concerned about how number 10 is rotated, and we're going to be taking care of that. Uh, we do have some gingival height discrepancies here. And so we can take care of gingival height discrepancies two ways. Uh, we can intrude or extrude, um, and, or we can just do a gingivectomy or crown lengthening. Um, in this case here, um, in order to intrude um, tooth number 23, that's actually a lot. Uh, we usually can get about a half a millimeter intrusion and about a half a millimeter extrusion pretty easily with aligners. So there's a good chance after everything is done that we may have to do some minor gingival recontouring. Now you may ask yourself, well, why, why not just line up all the incisal edges and sort of deal with the gums later? Well, you can certainly do that. What I find is that a lot of people's incisal edges are kind of jacked up from bruxing and they're uneven. So I'd rather have the gingival heights nice and perfect and just let me smooth out a few incisal edges than to start with straight incisal edges and hope to remove gum tissue and have it not grow back. So let's talk a little bit about the software ArchForm. So ArchForm can be downloaded for free from archform.co. It's not archform.com, it's archform.co. And so in the software, you, the dentist, move the teeth around and then they, the software will spit out a bunch of models for you. You print them and make your own aligner. As I said before, it's really recommended for orthodontists. So if you are a GP and you're proficient with ortho, um, or you want to just limit this to minor teeth movement cases, it's cool. But if I have anything that's more than maybe 12 aligners, I'm definitely sending it to either exceed ortho or just saying, screw it, I'm gonna send this whole case to Invisalign. So this is the case that we talked about before. So you can see here, chief complaint, 
two front teeth are sticking out a little too much, we've got some lower crowding that we want to take care of. Here's the case, and overall things do look pretty good. We don't have a lot of issues here. Definitely we have a spacing problem on the lower. We're going to be doing a an implant on number 19. So I don't want to distalize uh, any teeth there. I just want to maybe do a little bit of IPR, uh, rotate a few of these teeth, and, and tip a few teeth back. The Artform software is a very, very easy software to use, and there's not a lot of steps, really. Um, the first step, you just um, have sort of a template that you line your models up with. Um, you click on which teeth you want to include in the model. Um, the software segments the teeth pretty well. Um, you do have to spend maybe about 10 minutes um, sort of isolating each tooth. And then after that, you simply move the teeth where you want them. One thing that's a nice function of Archform is Archform will pick the most common attachment per tooth movement. The wizard, I guess, that picks it is kind of old school. It's definitely not the cool new Invisalign optimized attachments, but it's pretty cool stuff. It's, it, it, it does a pretty good job and you can certainly change the attachments and move the attachments if you want that level of control. Another really nice thing about Archform um, is that Archform um, can print vertically for you. Um, certainly lots of videos on the internet on how to print vertically. One thing that's paramount in printing vertically is that you have a flat surface to build your layers on. And Archform will actually develop a little kind of base for you so you can really load up your build plate. Um, matter of absolute personal uh, preference, I don't like printing vertically. I, it tends to be just a little too much work for me for most programs and also um, it takes longer, and the longer you're in the job of printing, the greater chance of print failure. So I do print most of my prints uh, horizontally, and I use supports, um, and this is just a matter of personal preference. So here's a model uh, and the attachments. So we ended up using a very small, almost ellipsoid attachment on number eight, uh, large rectangular attachment on 9, and number 10 uh, we have a horizontal attachment uh, which is best for extrusion, so we're going to try to pull that incisal edge down. We did IPR on pretty much all the centrals, or actually the mesial part of the laterals and the mesial of 8 and 9, and we did some IPR on the lower. Um, I like to put my attachments on first and then do the IPR next. I find that if I do the IPR first, I get a bunch of bonding in between the teeth and it's hard to kind of take that out. Okay, uh, one other aspect of ortho which I'm really fascinated about and I got to be honest with you, I don't have a lot of it, uh, experience with, but I'm doing a few cases, is uh, indirect bracket trays. So indirect bracket trays basically um, allow you to have an orthodontist plan your case for you, give you a bleaching tray in essence containing the brackets, you glue them on the teeth, and you're off to the races. So you change your wires out at specific times as indicated by the ClinCheck. Exceed Orthodontist Orthodontics does this in conjunction with Great Lakes Ortho. It's about $300 a case. Um, in this case here, we did uh, ceramic brackets. So you do get a clean check, which you approve. Um, this is a typical kid who didn't wear his retainer, uh, has just some minor crowding. Um, you know, we tried to get him to wear his retainer again and it just didn't fit. So the mom felt that since the kid wasn't good about wearing the retainer, he's not going to be good about wearing Invisalign or an aligner, so we're going to do brackets. So we ended up with ceramic brackets. This is what you get um, from Great Lakes Ortho. You get a tray with the brackets in. 
Um, you mark your midline, you put the brackets on. In this case, we used uh, 3M Transbond Plus. Cool thing about that is it changes colors when it's cured. And nice and easy, uh, we put the white wires on, uh, we marked the midline, and uh, we changed out, in this case, the wires every three weeks. Um, this is our final result. Uh, is it perfect? No, it's not perfect, but it's pretty good. Uh, the patient was super happy. Uh, we got this done in about three months. But if you are a dentist who has their own bracket system that you like to use and you want to make your own bracket tray, there is a company called IROC DDS. Now, IROC DDS also does what Exceed does with aligners. They charge about the same price. Um, i got to be honest with you, I've just never used them. Not because I have any opinion of IROC DDS. It's just that I've been sending cases to Exceed and they've been tracking really well and I'm happy with it, but there's a lot of docs out there that are really happy with IROC DDS as well. But for $50, you can tell them, hey, I use 3M brackets or six month smiles brackets, and can you set the case up for me? And I'll just print it out and make my own. So that's certainly a great way to go. All right, well, hey, thanks a lot for your attention. Um, you can always send me an email at augustdds at gmail.com. Uh, but better yet, go to digitalenamel.com and look at the cases. You can find us on Facebook at Digital Enamel and just go ahead and like it. Uh, 3D printing world is certainly changing. Um, you know, we've got even printers that print cheese. So uh, how do you like that? So anyways, thank you guys so much and uh, talk to you later.